Good afternoon. How are you? Do, do you feel like you're partway through the marathon? This has been a marathon conference, hasn't it? Oh, I, I wake up, I don't know what day it is. I, I don't remember if I ate, but I remember I had a lot of wine. <laughs> that reoccurring theme. Yes. Um, it's just, it's go, 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 go. And there's so much you want to go and see and you can't get into everything. And it's, it's so much decision making because you know that if you go to this, you're going to miss this. And you, you know that this is going to be great for your brain, but you don't want to... It's been such a great conference. The organization, uh, I just, I think has been sensational. And I was hugely remiss yesterday in not paying a massive tribute to our interpreters. I mean, how big a job is that? <laughs> Just absolutely sensational. So um, I, I say that as a, uh, as a precursor to the fact that I'm about to give them a real run for their money. Because, you know, I, I, I didn't know for sure whether I should do this or shouldn't do this. I'm going to open up with a song and I've made screens to the song with text. Uh, you know what, maybe the interpreters can tell me what they think I should do. And I don't know how they're going to tell me this. They can tell you and then you can tell me, okay? That's an idea. So if I generally, for English speaking audiences, I, I put the, the, the music on, I put the screen on, and then I just have the text and your forced to read the text silently while music and singing is in the background. Very difficult, but you know what, it's worth it because the song's so great. Uh, and, and, then, and then I change the screen. Would it be easier if when that particular screen comes on, I read it so that I'm reading it in English as you interpret it in Spanish, or am I better to just let the screens run and you as the magician, magical interpreters, figure out what you want to do. Let them, let, okay. You think I should read it? Okay, well then let me just tell you, I've never done this before, so it could really be a disaster. But when all is said and done, the music's great, so we'll see what happens. You know, we're informal, aren't we? Is that what, the, oh, is that, so is that what the interpreter said? I swear I'm going to kill myself on this. Is that what the interpreter said? Me read it. Okay. Should have rehearsed that, Ed. Sorry, but it's a good song, isn't it? We're, we're going to, uh, you know, this is being videoed. You're going to cut that whole first bit out. You can splice things, can't you? He can. He speaks Spanish. <laughs> he, needs, he needs an interpreter to say he needs to splice that. All right, try again. Take two. Take two. Thousand 
I'd carry on the marathon for you. <laughs> we know their world. We know the world's different today, depending on our age, when we got out of primary school or secondary school. Um, but I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in another five years, another ten years. Some of our little muffins who are only five years old and just starting their formalized academic career, what would the world be like when they leave high school and mo move into post-secondary education? With that world, we know, comes a lot of thinking. And, and I'm not saying for one second that we didn't need to know how to think, that we didn't need to know to be, how to be problem solvers and decision makers, and that we didn't need to know how to analyze and how to evaluate. And, but somehow, I think it's, it's so much more complex. It's so much more interconnected. And I think with that comes the moral imperative, to use Michael Fullan's words, that we actually think seriously about teaching and learning differently. 525,600 minutes in one year, we've got a fraction of that to make the difference that we, that, that we want to make with kids. But as importantly, the difference that we can make with kids. That's who we're working for. What a privilege, huh? Oh, that was very quick. Let's just scoot back there. Deep thinking for deep learning, it doesn't just happen. I've really been on a bit of a journey myself, I, I guess, in the last number of years. Really thinking about the difference between teaching kids how to learn, teaching kids how to think skillfully, and the relationship between those, and teaching kids how to learn deeply, teaching kids how to think deeply, and the relationship between those. Because I, I think that they're different 
different things. And, and um, for that reason, I thought I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time that we have today really trying to um, start to explore with you this whole idea of what is deep thinking and what is deep learning and what are their relationships to learning how to be an independent self-directed autonomous learner but perhaps not deeply and thinking skillfully but perhaps not deeply hmm things that make you go hmm uh, big welcome here's our learning map and, and, I, and I have a feeling that I'm being a little overzealous in what I'm hoping to manage in now 45 minutes. <laughs> like that introduction was worth 15 minutes of our time, you know? What am I thinking? I'm not thinking deeply. Anyway, um, I'm going to just briefly touch on, on yesterday, really more as a, uh, as a graphic. So if you're in here, how many of you were at the keynote yesterday? Let me just, let me just take a peek. Okay, so the lion's share for sure. Some of you weren't, and I can't get into the learning model uh, because obviously we just don't have the time. Um, I touched on thinking yesterday where I talked about the learning piece in a lot more detail. I'm going to talk about the thinking piece in more detail. And I did talk to you yesterday about the relationship briefly about the thinking and the learning. So if I sort of tr tr try and jog your memory, I showed you thinking, the learning map, and then I talked about the fact that at any stage, I want kids to be able to tell me what their learning job is, what their thinking job is, what intellectual dispositions they need, and what thinking tools they could use at that stage. And then they move to the next stage. Is that ringing bells? Okay, I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to do this dance between talking about deep thinking and deep, uh, deep learning and deep thinking. And then I'll go back into the thinking piece and into the learning piece for as long as we have. And in 45 minutes, you can just walk out. And I'll just keep talking. <laughs> I, 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 I will address some d different aspects of this bigger puzzle, bigger elephant, uh, tomorrow when I actually talk about the co cognitive um, information processing system and cognitive load, um, I'll bring in some other pieces. In particular, I was asked today about the so what. You know, I had a need to scuba dive. How do we have curriculum that we're mandated toward and set it up in such a way that kids have a so what or have a need that will drive things? I'm going to address that tomorrow. So for anybody else that's got that same question, because if I were you, I'd have that question, then, then I'm going to tackle that then. I had to break things up because an hour is just not really enough time to speak about anything. So hopefully by the time we get the three bits, the bigger picture will be there. So we'll, we'll see how we manage with those last two points, starting with learning. So that was the learning, uh, the learning process that I showed you yesterday, and I talked about the fact that I, I developed this by reverse engineering how I learn, and that, you know, may, maybe to make a point or, or to um, uh, stress a point that might not have come through as, as uh, importantly as it perhaps needed to, is that kids can start anywhere in this process. They can start with an idea. And then they can actually say, well, what do you really, uh, you know, know and understand that's going to enable you to put that in place? And that could lead them to all kinds of questions that gets them immersing themselves, which could get them refining their original idea. Does that, does that, does that make sense? I don't want you to see it as this, you've got to do this and do this and, and, and do this. The only time that I go through it methodically is really when I'm actually teaching them the process. Because it's pretty hard to understand a process if you're starting anywhere. But a process is a system. And if you've been involved in any of Bill Martin's work this week, um, Rosemary Hipkins did some work this week on systems thinking. Systems are, are, are quite convoluted <laughs> with a, a lot of diff different relationships that can occur. I've just, this is simplified. I don't want a kid to say, what next? You ever say that to you when you're teaching? Done. What next? I want a kid to know where he is, where he's going, and how he's going to get there. And without a process that's 
explicit. I, I don't see how we'll ever get there with children. I just don't. Whether they're little or big, I think they'll get it quicker when they're big. So, you know, it, it, it's a journey. And initially, I own that, and I'm not apologizing. You know, I want to teach kids with privilege comes responsibility. It is a privilege to learn as an independent, self-directed learner, and that comes with the responsibility that you're not going to independently, self-directedly fluff about. And, and, and so I will own it. And they will have choices at every stage within structure. But as they develop their knowledge and understanding of the process and the tools and the strategies, we'll move into much more a collaborative design until eventually they're enabled and they're empowered to use the models, whether it's a learning model, a, a, their thinking model, their dispositional models, to actually start taking greater control of that process. Okay. If you want kids to learn how to learn and not be independently, self-directedly fluffing about, then we've got to ensure that their thinking is skillful at each stage of the process. And so we've got to delve into some really important questions, like what does it actually mean to think? You know, we use that word interchangeably with kids all the time. Off you go, go and think about it. Huh? Put on your thinking cap. I'll, I'll tell you, when you tell a big kid, go and think about it, they look up, look down, and hope you never come back. What does it mean to think? Is there a difference between thinking and thinking skillfully? I mean, that, that's been a reoccurring theme throughout the whole process, uh, throughout the whole um, conference. We think. From the minute you get up in the morning till the minute you go to bed at night, you think. You could not stop a child from thinking if you tried. Doesn't mean they're thinking skillfully. Doesn't mean they're thinking rigorously. Doesn't mean they're thinking deeply. Is skillful thinking natural? Thinking's natural. But is skillful thinking natural? And I guess, you know, a big question I've got to ask is, what are the implications if thinking skillfully is not natural on the learning of our kids? So if thinking skillfully isn't natural, and you may not believe that, but if you do, then is thinking something that should be taught? I know I wasn't taught how to think. I turned out okay. My, my, my answer to that is, what if they could turn out better? And if, in fact, it can be taught, how the heck am I going to do that? And that, that's part of the reason for coming to a conference like this, because what you're, what you're um, being immersed in is so many different possibilities for how to make something like this happen in your, in your businesses, in your schools, in your classrooms. And that's what I think is so exciting, because I'll tell you, there's none of us that have this game right. But my way might be more right for you. You know, Bob Schwartz's way might be more right for you. You know, um, you and Macintosh might be, or you might be saying, you know, I like this little bit Lane's doing, I'm sort of into this bit that Bob's doing, Ewan's doing this bit, and you create what's right for you. All I can share with you is the journey I've taken and where it's brought me in not only my thinking, but so I know it, so I think it, so what? I'm showing you how I used what I know, what I understand, what I've learned, what I can do to make a difference in my life and the life of kids. But that's not because it's the way it should be for you. It's just provocation to perhaps get you thinking about things that you hadn't considered around pedagogic approaches and instructional design. That's a really important question for me. And in the early days of the thinking conferences, for those of you who attended, everything was really about thinking. So you learned this thinking tool, and you learned this thinking strategy, and you learned this thinking routine. And sometimes we talked about, you know, it could look like this in this lesson. You could textualize, contextualize it this in this lesson. I, I, that frustrated me, because I don't teach in lessons. I don't... Um, I, 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 Teaching kids lessons, even though you're developing their thinking, to me, isn't going to eventually get them to the point where they can stop saying, what next? Because when that lesson's done and that thinking, thinking is done, you're going to have to design another lesson and put the thinking in that. 
and then design another lesson and put the thinking in that. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? That was, that, it's not frustrating for all people. For me, it drove me mad. And so I really started to question, what is this relationship between thinking and learning? And as soon as I really started, you know, perseverating on the fact that learning's a process and recognizing that I had to get that process, uh, you know, explicit, transparent for my kids so they could own it, I had to really start thinking about how that thinking would, would synthesize with that learning model. Kids think. You think. Yeah? I think. We want to think. Yeah. Technicolor. So let's talk about thinking skills, because um, David Perkins said this beautifully in, in his opening keynote, we think. What, what we're doing with respect to thinking skills and then, then the strategies or the tools we give them is we're using those as scaffolds or we're using them as cues to get the thinking skillful. Because they're evaluating, but they might be evaluating with a lot of bias. Or they might be evaluating and not considering, you know, perspectives. They might be eva evaluating and, you know, really evaluating and seeing all those pros because they have an emotional disposition toward liking it. And so they can't see any of the negatives or the cons. The emotion is dictating the evaluation. Does that make sense? So if we give kids thinking, th th thinking tools... And we, and, and we uh, highlight those skills, i.e. an evaluative skill, those kids will be in a position to A, understand that evaluation is a skill, and B, understand that you, you're going you're gonna to do it in spite of me, but you mightn't do it well. So let's just look at the skills part, okay? Lots of thinking skills. We need kids relating and inferring, comparing, contrasting, hypothesizing, ranking, classifying, predicting, problem solving, ideating, innovating. I haven't even touched the surface. And there's not one of these that you're going to tell me isn't important for kids to develop. What we've done curricularly is we've taken all these thinking skills and we've packaged them in critical thinking skills or creative thinking skills. But that's all them. So. If you want to look at critical thinking skills, you're going to look at things like classifying, comparing, contrasting, relating, reasoning, sequencing. Analyzing is getting kids to examine the parts, examine the whole, look at, at, at how the parts fit together, it could be about examining information, managing information, examining self, examining others, managing self, managing others. So I say to my teachers, this is the macro thinking skill, and these are the micro skills that make it up. I'm not going to teach a learner to analyze. Off you go, honey, analyze. Yes, Ms. Clark, they don't know what I'm talking about, but they'll learn these sub-skills are enabling you to examine more skillfully. Evaluating to determine significance or worth to judge the value or condition to decide. So when we get kids judging self, we want them to judge their skills, we want them to judge their knowledge, we want them to judge their thinking and the thinking of others. When they judge others, oh sorry, their actions, when, when they judge others, we want them to judge their skills and their knowledge. We want them to judge their thinking and their actions. They need to judge sources. They need to judge information. What are they judging for? Bias, omissions, faulty logic, clarity, accuracy, and precision. Now that's developmental. I'm not going to tell you to do that at five. Where we usually start with kids in terms of success criteria is we get kids evaluating generally for omissions, stuff they missed, and for accuracy. You missed the full stop on that sentence. But do you see how it's important to eventually deepen that ability to evaluate by starting to look at bias, by, by actually starting to look at faulty logic? Uh, of, of course, concluding and deciding and ranking are all part of the, 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 the package of evaluative thinking. And when we talk about synthesis, we're talking about creative thinking. So we're actually looking at all those parts in a new and different whole. So analysis was you're dealing with the same parts, the same whole. 
As soon as you move into synthesis, it's creativity because you got a brand new hole that didn't exist before. So we're talking about when kids predict, when they hypothesize, when they infer, when they generalize, when they question, and when they create new products, new ideas, new systems, when they create solutions and alternatives and recommendations. And all those thinking skills work together to enable processing to occur. They're not hierarchical. You don't analyze and then evaluate and then synthesize. Processing is the act of analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing. That's what grows understanding. They're inextricably linked. I need to teach all of my children those skills. Because just like anything else you want to teach in the world, you teach it by teaching skills. So if you want your kids to become um, fabulous at measuring, you teach measuring skills. Is that true? You want kids to become readers. Do you teach reading skills? You want your children to become writers. Do you teach writing, writing skills? If you want to become a chef, do you have to go out there and learn some cooking skills? So if you want your kids to think, then they need to learn. It, and this is how I'm talking to you is how I talk to kids. They need to understand this. We need to demystify this whole thinking thing. They, this is how we talk. They've got to understand this. It's just, it's a skill. It's something that you're going to learn. A skill is something you do. Cooking, measuring, reading, writing, uh, you know, thinking. There's it's stuff you do. There's skills involved. I'm going to teach those. And you're going to practice them. Because would we expect kids to become a writer if we taught them the skill of punctuation, gave them one shot, and moved on? It's not any different. So, so when you teach these thinking skills, this is something that you're going to need to be committed to. It's not, oh yeah, you know what, we did hypothesis once this term. Oh, we, we did relating. I did relating last week in that lesson. Maybe I'll do it next month. You, 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 you have to look at thinking the way you look at any other skill development curricularly with children or life skill development. And this is the exciting thing. I'm going to give them tools to help them develop the skill. I want you to think about this, okay? I want you to think about this whole idea of tools because this starts to make so much sense for children, all right? When I want you to measure, I teach you measuring skills. Would you agree? Do I give you tools to measure? What do I give you? I give you a ruler, don't I? Or I, you know what, you might be into non-standard measurements, so I give you your finger. If I want you to um, write, and we're developing skills for writing, what tools do we get? Do we get a pen or a pencil? Do we get our, our, our laptop or our tablet? Uh, do we get uh, um, uh, some, sometimes a, a, um, a, um, a dictionary, sometimes a thesaurus? Do you see how you give them tools to develop the skill? So if I said to you, in your language then, what would you say a tool is? A tool is something that helps you. If it's a tool for measurement, it helps you measure. If it's a tool for writing, it helps you write. If it's a tool for reading, it helps you read. If it's a tool for cooking, it helps you cook. If it's a tool for building, a saw, a hammer, um, it helps you build. So if I give you tools for thinking, they're going to help you. And wait for translation. <laughs> tools. Elementary Watson. I give you tools to develop your cooking skills and tools to develop your building skills. I give you tools to develop your writing skills and your drawing skills. And I give you tools to develop your math skills. Well, you know what I'm going to do now, my beautiful children? I'm going to give you tools to develop your thinking skills. And I need teachers to know that you already use a million thinking tools. You, don't, you just don't call them tools, and the children don't see them that way. Do any of you use graphic organizers? They're simply tools to help you manage information. Because organized information facilitates thinking. Does anybody use success criteria with children or adults? So uh, criteria is a tool to help you self-reflect and self-judge. 
You use this stuff, thinking routines, success criteria, learning strategies, information organizers. I say the whole kit and caboodle, they are tools. Any aid to, to, to um, develop your thinking is a tool. And so I have this other framework called Thinkbox. Don't get scared. It's not scary. It's a framework for learning how to think because it's imperative in my world that kids understand explicitly and they understand transparently and visibly that learning is a process and they own that. I don't want thinking ethereal for them. I want them to truly be able to see the parts of thinking and the whole of thinking. I also have Think Tower, which is a visual framework. So it's exactly like Thinking Box. The only difference between Think Box and Think Tower is it's all picture based, not just for little who don't read, but for visual spatial kids. I say to my kids, all this thing is, is a house for your thinking tools. Does that make sense? All right, I want you to note these bolded words, because there's bolded words in each section. These bolded words represent your thinking job. And then all of these are the tools you could pick to help you do the job. If your learning job is to find out and explore and discover, these are all your tools. If your learning job is to internalize your learning or record or report your learning, all your tools are in the purple section. If your learning, uh, sorry, thinking job is to help you organize or manage, organize or manage yourself, organize or manage other people, organize and manage information, because the job is organization and management, then your tools are in orange. If your job is to, look, judge or decide, you've got your tools in blue. And if your job is to invent, your tools are in green. Now, it's not so scary now, is it? The reason it has a lot of words is there's a lot of tools. If I limited the words, I'd, limited, I'd limit the tools. And if I limited the tools, I'd limit choice. And if I limited choice, I would limit learning. I would limit student voice. I would limit ownership. If your learning job, or your thinking job rather, is to explore, find out, or discover, you can go to experts and, uh, and phone them, but maybe you're going to audio video conference them. In which case, you'll need your computer and you'll probably need a tablet. You can find out through experimenting. You can find out through websites. You can find out through illustrations. In fact, you can find out from all kinds of stuff that's not on here. Because see all these blank sections? Write it in. I can't have a tool that have, has every blessed tool in the world on it. Is that, and new technologies, new tools are developing all the time. I, I, I want them to be able to just see where they fit against everything else they know and understand. My kids know that even though these are your thinking skills, I'm saying that's your, that's your thinking job. It's what you need to do in terms of your thinking right now. Those are your tools. Starting to make sense? Okay. If you need to record a report and you're a pretty, you know, linguistic kid, you could use a pen or a pencil or you could use your computer and software. You could use pictures and, and use a crayon and a paper, or you could use a camera. See, what I care about is kids, can they make the decision on how they want to record their learning? Can they choose their tools, strategies, and justify their choice? You're going to have times where you have to report what you know, and I'm going to say report it with any tools and strategies you want. You pick, you justify. That's your thinking job. Those are your tools. If your job is to organize, to manage yourself or information or other people, you've got tools. If your job is to judge and decide, you've got tools. And ultimately, if your job is to invent, and what are we inventing, by the way? We're inventing the so what? 
We're inventing solutions to problems, alternatives, possibilities, goals, products. We're inventing plans. We're inventing the future. And then we will invent a communication vehicle to get those ideas to the right audience. And you will have creative thinking tools. Tools for finding out, tools for internalizing, recording, reporting, tools for organization and management, tools for decision making and evaluation, and tools for invention. Does that make sense? It's hard because the lights are down, I can't see your faces. Think Tower, I won't go through the whole thing, but it's, it's, it's very similar. So there's their, their, their key um, thinking job to explore or discover. And you can explore or discover using a puzzle, using an audio video conference. You can explore and discover through models, through drama, through television, through phone calls with experts, through graphs, CDs, DVDs, photographs, or anything else you want to put a picture to. I am explicit and I am visible. These models are up for me every second of the day and every day we're using thinking tools and engaging in the development of our thinking skills and I'll be showing kids, oh my goodness, we're finding out right now, what's our tool? Oh my goodness, we're managing information, let's circle that. Initially I use these tools, children don't. I use them so I can ensure those skills are a part of my uh, instructional design and that I know what tools I'm using so I can name them for the children. If those kids don't know the tools they're using and you haven't named them, then I'm going to guarantee with everything I am they'll never own them. They may use them when you tell them to, but they'll never make the decision until we start making it, I call it inking my thinking or talking my thinking. So initially it's all about me. I'm planning the tools, the kids are living them, they're experiencing them, and then they're evaluating them. They have a thinking journal, and that thinking journal is for the purpose of reflecting on their learning, sk learning skills, uh, thinking skills, and thinking tools. So we might use a Venn diagram, and I'm going to say, well, what were the strengths and what were the weaknesses of using that Venn? How did it help you? How did it actually hinder your thinking? What bits were confusing? Would you use it again? Do you want to try something different? Would you modify its design? As soon as kids can say to you, oh, I would have rather used this, this would have been better, that didn't work, can we do, what they're saying is, could you go home and get a life? <laughs> and could you let me in on this gig called thinking? What will happen next is we'll start co-planning. Just like eventually I'll start co-planning the stages of the learning process with them, I'll start co-planning what tools we're using. And so it's going to look like this. There's me doing all the planning. But it's explicit, it's visible. I'm showing them what's going to be in this learning journey. Now we're starting to co-plan. So there's Think Tower Velcroed on the wall. I've got a piece, they've got their own black and white, and they're planning with me. These are actually some kids from one of my schools in the UK that's um, with me today. Gervois, where are you? Hands up. You're somewhere. I saw you walk in. There you go. There you go. Th this is actually their kids, independent, self-directed in their teams, not only identifying their, their uh, thinking job, but their thinking tools and when they use them so they can start m recognizing what thinking they were doing at what stage of the learning process. They can start seeing what thinking tools they repeated multiple times and which ones are more used at a particular stage than another. Hello, beauty. She's not five years old yet. And she is completely capable of identifying, in retrospect, what thinking tools she used in our little journey together. Learning requires thinking. So what's the relationship between the learning piece and the thinking piece? That relationship? Well. It's sort of what I showed you yesterday. They've got their own model for process that they're coloring in, and they've got their own models for thinking that they color in. And the big dream is that at, at some stage, they will be able to, at any point in time, tell me what their learning job is at this stage, and what their thinking job is. 
What thinking tools can you take off ThinkBox or ThinkTower that will help you be a great thinker so you can be a great learner? Now it's your learning job. What thinking do you need to do? What thinking tools or strategies can you choose off ThinkBox or ThinkTower that will help you be a great thinker so you can be a great learner? Coloring in as they move through the learning journey, tracking their thinking as they move through their learning journey, Stand up, have a quick stretch and a quick chat. Two minutes. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Oh, I'm going to have to tell you, and I got you back in four. He took all the way to one. That was good. Okay. Um, I'm just conscious that I should move on. We've got 15 minutes, uh, not even, not quite. And um, I know that, there, that there's been some issue with some of us taking too long. So I, I, I'm conscious and respectful of your time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us on a bit. And um, move into now these two sections. I can already tell that I'm in trouble. So I'm thinking on my feet right now in terms of what screens I'm not showing you and which ones I am. Um, the interesting thing is... Um, how long is break? No, after Brendan it's break. After Brendan Spillane in the auditorium, there's a break, uh, there's a coffee break, all right? So, and this room is not being taken until after that. So I'm just putting it out there that if any of my dear friends uh, w want to see a little bit more, that I'll come after Brendan back here. And it could be a private tutor of two, but, but it's an option. All right, let's, let's see where we get to here. Now I'm, 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 I'm treading very closely to starting to bring in some of the cognitive scientific research that I'm going to talk about tomorrow. One of the things that um, has really impacted my pedagogic practice is research on how the brain learns uh, and ultimately how it processes. Um, the, 
because if I'm going to really advance thinking, I've got to do it um, in a way that is in keeping with how the brain actually thinks and processes. Does that make any sense? But the number of teachers that I've met, and me myself, who really have no understanding of how the brain processes information, the cognitive processing system of the brain, it's, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. The more you understand how the brain processes, the more you'll start to understand what I'm on about when I talk about deep learning. I love Robert Marzano's work because he has crystallized very easily for me and, and the teachers I work with how to try and start to see depth. Kids need to acquire and integrate knowledge before they can extend and refine it. Extension and refinement is depth. Does that make sense? You can't have depth of nothing. So you've got to have a stage in your learning with your learners where they're acquiring new information and they're integrating it into prior knowledge or prior schema. And as they start to integrate that, you want them to extend and refine by seeing connections and relationships. Depth is relational thinking. If kids try to ideate and implement fabulous ideas, and they have no deep knowledge and understanding, that will be fluffy as and ridiculous. We have all kinds of programs out there where kids are being creative for the sake of being creative. And there's real no rigor, really no rigor that's, that's been developed to, to grow that idea, but we're giving them opportunities to just think creatively. There's a place for that. There is a place for giving kids opportunities to simply be creative with whatever they do or don't already have in, in, their, in terms of schemata. But there are, are, are other situations where I want kids developing deep knowledge and deep understanding so that what they create, what they produce, the solutions, the recommendations are rigorous and deep. I'm hoping that makes some sense. So, I say to teachers, and this is why I love Marzano's work, is that I just happen to call acquiring and integrating my immersion stage. I just happen to call extension and refinement my investigate, organize, internalize stage. And I just happen to, to call using learning meaningfully my ideate stage. You can call it anything. So if you're more comfortable with using a learning model by Guy, Guy Claxton or a learning model by Ewan McIntosh or, you know, a learning model that's out there, What's not negotiable is these stages in the process. Call them whatever you want. Does that make sense? And if you don't want to teach through a process, what I talk to my teachers about is the fact that when you design your lessons, when you design your units, are you cognizant of what and how you're designing for an acquiring and integrated stage versus an extension refinement stage? And are you bringing kids, to my words, the so what, but using their learning meaningfully? Let me give you an example, all right? I talked to you yesterday uh, about my scuba diving and the fact that, you know, at that ID8 stage, I implemented my so what, I went for the dive, but I monitored and tested the result. I went down, I freaked out, I came up, I didn't see a piece of seaweed. And so I didn't make the intended difference. But I also talked about a real school context where the kids made fairy tale books for little children in Africa that had no books and sent those books to Africa with a throwaway camera with a posted uh, self-addressed envelope and a letter. Take photos as soon as these kids get our books, take photos at the end of the first week, take photos at the end of three weeks and three months. And so those kids didn't know whether they made a difference in the lives of those children in Africa for three full months. We don't try and make a difference in our life, the life of others, because it looks good on paper. If we're truly trying to make a difference, we need a follow-up. Does that make sense? So in, in that context, my kids were going to need to learn about fairy tales. Would you agree? How do you make fairy tales for kids in Africa that have no books if you don't learn fairy tales? They were going to have to learn about the culture of the children in Africa. Does that make sense? How do you write a culturally sensitive book if you know nothing about your audience? They were going to need to know about illustrations. That's going to be, you're, you're, you're teaching kids in Africa, English is a second language. What's going to be the most important part of the book? 
pictures. You're, you're going to need to know how to make a book. You're not going to send rubbish. You need the quality of a good book. And you need to know the publishing process because you're going to need to publish your illustrations so they're quality and, and publish the actual fairy tale writing. So these are all curricular areas attached to this so what that children needed to acquire knowledge uh, uh, and integrate it into prior schema. At the acquiring and integrating phase, what you're trying to do is this. Get those kids acquiring new learning about fairy tales and integrating it into prior schema. See, watch. There's your original schema. I'm going to grow it. During the acquiring and integrating uh, phase of the learning, you're, we're going to look at what you know about culture, and you're going to acquire new knowledge and integrate it into prior schema. You're going to, uh, you know, develop knowledge and understanding about the structure of books, about illustrations, and about publishing. Does that make sense? That's what it means to acquire and integrate. All right. At the extension and refinement phase, you are not learning any more new stuff. I'm extending and refining what you already know. You're not acquiring anything new. We're extending and refining what you already know. Does that make sense? And so it's going to look like this. You're helping kids see connections and make relationships, which is deeper thinking than at the acquiring and integrating phase. I want them to see that they're going to need to use the publishing process for their illustrations, use the publishing process when they publish their fairy tale story, and ultimately when they make their book. They're, they're, they're going to have to say, so what do I know about their culture? How am I going to put that in the character setting and plot of the fairy tale? How am I going to put what I learned about culture in the pictures? At the using learning meaningfully stage, they're empowered and they're enabled to actually create a quality fairy tale. You could have given kids this, this opportunity to be immersed and decide they want to make fairy tales for kids in Africa. But if you don't have the acquiring stage and the extending and refining stage right, then they're going to produce the book and it's going to be rubbish. Can a kid learn deeply if they don't think deeply? So it's actually not just about developing a learner's thinking skills, so they develop skillful thinking. I need them to also develop deep thinking. My kids will be analyzing at the acquiring and integrating phase, but they'll be analyzing at a deeper level at the extension refinement stage. They'll be relating. They'll be questioning. Uh, they'll be comparing and contrasting. But they'll be doing it again here at a deeper, uh, uh, at a deeper uh, level. If we want our kids to learn deeply, then they need to think deeply. So now I'm in, a, in the middle of a bit of a, a, a conundry because my intention right now, and I'm out of time, am I? My intention right now is to actually take the skill of analyzing and in specific information organizers that we give kids to manage information and show you what they look like at, say, an acquiring and integrating stage versus an extension refinement stage. What's that? Do it? I got a couple I got a couple seconds, do I? All right. Do it in the break. Okay, okay. So so what you'll what if you if, if you come back, um, what I what I'll do is I'll show you what it would look like for kids to acquire and integrate in their collection of data in that early stage of learning and how it would start to shift and change as you move them into that extension refinement phase. Because what's important for me is that teachers realize that thinking according to Bloom's taxonomy, it, it, it's not hierarchical. You don't analyze before you evaluate and then you synthesize. Because if we thought that way, we would be doing what we call lower level thinking here and higher level thinking here. Well, you're going to see 
if we have some more time together, and, and if not today, I, I'll have a, a bit of time tomorrow to, to, to touch on some of this, is they are analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing here and here. This is just more relational because I'm growing that, that depth. As they move up the process, will become more relational in the tools that we give them and the tools that we design. And we'll grow their depth. Oh, I just didn't get through very much, did I? Sheesh. I'm so mad at myself for spending 10 minutes on that silly song. Note to self. They got a different world. They're, 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 they're in a different world now than we would have had, depending on our ages. And it's, it's going to continue to become more complex and, and, more, uh, and, and, and more interconnected with challenges that will mean not only skillful thinking, but deep thinking. It's not just about helping them develop their thinking skills and their use of thinking tools. It's about the right tool at the right time in the process. We think. We need to think. We got less than that, but we got enough minutes to make a difference in their lives. Thanks. come here at coffee break if you want to see uh, just quickly the reframing of information organizers for depth. All right? If I see, I see ya. Beauty.